Lynn Roundtree, the artist, uh, is just a humble musician uh, first. Uh, I'm so thankful I've got an opportunity to learn how to play an instrument in the first place. And uh, secondly, uh, the opportunity to be able to write music. Third, to be able to take that music and put it uh, in a form that would enable me to, to spread it throughout the country and throughout the world. And I'm just so appreciative that um, people enjoy listening to my music, enjoy listening to my recorded and performing music, but it all starts out as a, a humble musician. And I say humble because in, uh, in this business, as with anything, uh, you're, you have to stay humble, you have to stay hungry, you have to continue to strive to get better. Uh, so that's who Lynn Roundtree, the musician, the artist is. I was first introduced to music when I came out of the womb. The doctor said, "This was my first introduction." No, I'm just kidding. Uh, my, my, there was music was always rich in my house. My father was, uh, I want to say, a wannabe musician. He always had his guitar. He was always singing something. And my mama loved uh, gospel music, and she loved uh, all her songs. And uh, my first introduction into, you know, just really hearing somebody play was my father every morning. Uh, my mother would get up at the crack of dawn and be out the door and go to work and I'd be left with my father at his mercy uh, to be his audience so he could pick up his guitar and play along to either the OJs or the, F the Five Blind Boys of Alabama or something. So every morning uh, before I went to school, uh, when we were getting ready, he would break out his guitar and start singing along and, and you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be his one audience and I'd be, yay, dad, yay. And so that was my induction into, uh, into, into music, into performing music. And I take some of that stuff with me nowadays uh, when I'm on stage. I know you can never see me on stage, but uh, yeah, it all comes from my father and my family. My, again, my father played the cornet. His mother played the cornet. And uh, his mother, unfortunately, passed away when she was really, really young. Uh, but she left him a coronet and he took it and he, she passed when he was four years old. But she left him his coronet. And so when he came of age, he took the coronet and played it in high school, high school marching band. So you know, he would always tell me the story and my grandfather would always tell me the story. And so I said, well, I want that coronet. You know, when I get, get old enough, my dad said, you can't have it, you can't have it, you're not ready for it, you're not ready for it. But when I was ready for it, the coronet wasn't ready for me because it had gotten corroded. <laughs> so, uh, but nevertheless, in fifth grade, uh, my dad said, it, it's time, we're going we're gonna to get you all involved in, uh, in, uh, in music. And obviously there was no other choice for me than, than the trumpet. Uh, even though it wasn't the coronet, I thought they were two different instruments at the time. Uh, he said, the trumpet will be all right and you can gravitate to, to the, the coronet and we get it fixed. But that never happened and I stuck with the trumpet. So yeah, fifth grade. Uh, that's when I started playing and, uh, and getting out of class and uh, learning how to play, play the trumpet, which again, I don't know if we'll go into this, but leads me to why music in schools is so uh, such an invaluable uh, 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 form of, um, of uh, education for, for kids. After college, I went to Florida a and University uh, on, a, on a music scholarship and uh, part music, part business which did me well today, uh, having that balance. And I uh, played in the Marching 100, which is uh, the baddest marching band in the land, I have to say, fam you, Rattlers. Uh, so uh, uh, that uh, led me down the path of, of wanting to play and also seeing some of the musicians that would come through on a regular basis, Went Marsalis, uh, Wyclef, uh, all of these, these great uh, musicians, Scotty Barnhart, trumpet players uh, used to come through all the time and give seminars and, and hang out with us and uh, we just see what kind of life they had and what kind of life we could aspire to have you know, if we went down that path. But of course when I left college, I was into music, I wanted, I wanted my money, you know, I wanted to, to, to be a business person, but after a year and working in the business and really not playing the horn a lot after I'd played so much in, in college and it had always been a part of my life, uh, it was in my closet and I decided to pick it up again. And, uh, uh, after probably about six months, I got back on practicing. Uh, my neighbor heard me playing, and they asked uh, if I wanted to play a wedding. And I said, well, I don't know what I'm doing, but yeah, I'll play. I'll find a piano player and we'll play. 
uh, and uh, went and played the wedding and you know, we were nervous. We had our real fake books uh, and uh, we played a few songs and we started to vibe and uh, people clapped and they gave us, you know, $25 a piece. And I said, wow, I actually made some money from playing the trumpet. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, this might, this might work. Knowing what I know now, the $25, I probably wouldn't have stayed, but just getting some money for doing something that you love and getting a taste of it uh, was, was something that I said, well, no, I know I have to get down this path and pursue this because you know, I like business, but how can I merge business and music playing through my trumpet uh, and, uh, and make, make it a career? Uh, and certainly that's uh, what it's evolved into now. I love all genres of music, and the one thing I don't like is a whole lot of categories on music. And I know there's different types of music, but especially when you talk about jazz, I mean, you could have, you know, hours and hours and hours of discussion about what jazz really is. And you know, some people say, well, this is the old school, it's the cat, but then you go back and you understand that jazz evolved from big band music, which was the popular music of today, back in the 30s. You had big bands like Count Basie and Duke Ellington and, and all of these guys, and that was the Little Wayne of their day. I mean, they went out to, to hear these bands, and there weren't there wasn't a Dizzy Gillespie, there wasn't a Charlie Parker, there wasn't a you know, do 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 do. And the way jazz evolved is that uh, you know it, it evolved as as a result of uh, a financial situation for club owners, uh, where the big bands uh, played. The New York Authority wanted to get wanted to tax these bands and play, you know, and, and tax them, you know, if you had people in there dancing. So these club owners got smart and said, well, look, you know what? Uh, we want the billing of a Count Basie band, but we don't want to pay the tax if there are people in the room dancing. So what we're going to do is we're going to take five people out of the Count Basie band and say, we have Count Basie's band in our club, which would get the draw and the people in, but we're going to make them play the music fast and play it at a tempo to where people can't dance to it. And that birthed bebop. And I'm saying this to say that, you know, jazz, particularly, uh, you know, what we think jazz is or what some other people think jazz is, takes on a lot of different shapes and a lot of different forms. And so my appeal, as you asked to, to, to the music, is how it continues to evolve and change. Uh, and, you know, how that moniker jazz just encompasses so much because when you, you know, you go from to bebop, to, to modern bop, to cool, you know, to when Miles Davis went from that and brought, changed that music to cool jazz, now you got West Coast jazz, and then you get fusion, and you get all the, 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 the Lonious Monk, and the, the Don Coltrane, and modal jazz, you know what I mean? And then you get free jazz, and, and now it's come full circle, you get the contemporary jazz, and, and the smooth jazz, which to me is really smooth soul, but all these elements of jazz go into R&B, go into pop music, go into all this other music, so it, the, the, what interests me about this is, it, is how it evolves. And that's what I'm trying to do with Soul Tree, uh, the Soul Jazz Experience, is I'm trying to evolve the music and take the music in another direction, uh, branch it out. I'm not saying I'm trying to make it better or worse, or, or I'm just trying to evolve it uh, to transition, to make a new transition. And that's where I think the music always goes. And so for me, with my music and Soul Tree is a collection of everything that I've listened to in my life, gospel music, uh, you know, soul music, uh, R&B, grunge music, heavy metal, uh, uh, reggae, you know, you name it. I listen to it, if it sounds good, I listen to it, but you'll hear a lot of those elements throughout my CDs, my project, and particularly on this new album, Soul Tree, Soul Jazz Experience. My greatest achievement thus far in music is to put out three CDs, have put out three CDs. Um, and this third CD is, a, is kind of a culmination of that. Obviously, we're gonna keep going. Uh, as long as I'm kicking, I'll continue to create music. Uh, but uh, my, my greatest achievement is the, com is, com is the combination of the three CDs that I actually have out. I was impressed that I even had one out, but it didn't hit me. Uh, when I made the second one, it was sort of business-like because, you know, we had done the first one. We just so stuck in the business of making a, a, a second CD. Uh, and the, but the third CD, the, the combination of those three CD, those two CDs, and then this third one, which I did produce all on my own and, and you know, I, I, well, I had a lot of people helping, but I, I was executive producer, I, I produced the CD, I packaged it, I, I had it pressed up, I had it mixed, I had it mastered, I sent it off and had it put in, uh, but that was because I had learned what I learned on the first two CDs, so the collection of those three leading to this one, 
probably the biggest compliment of my life. And just being able to take that and, and have music heard from people all over the world, you know, and, and people chime in from all over different parts of the world saying, hey, I heard your music. I love your music. You know, going on CD Baby and seeing somebody from uh, Australia just bought my CD. Man, somebody in Australia, the land, I've never been to Australia. I don't know what's in Australia other than what you see on TV. A pygmy bought my CD, I don't know. And, uh, you know, so you have people in Africa buying my CD. No Lynn Roundtree and hear my music. Uh, and, and, you know, but that's, 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 that's one of my, that's, that is my biggest achievement. We know about all these classic songs. There's one hit wonders. Full of, you know, countries, worlds full of one hit wonders who are still playing and performing because of those one hits. <laughs> and, and those were so, you know, so meaningful to people from the heart uh, that, you know, it, it allows them to continue to, to work and, and play all their lives. And so, yeah, the longevity, and also the longer it takes for you to develop your craft, I think the longer it takes, the longer you'll be playing your craft, the longer you'll be in your craft. You know, you can't just up and say, well, I'm, a, I'm gonna sing. Boom, get out there. There are people who've done that, but like again, here today, gone today. It's those people who are on the grind, who understood how to sing, understood their instruments, practice and practice and practice and practice and practice, put all this soul and heart and sweat and blood and tears into their music. Uh, they may not sometimes achieve the, the critical success, success or claim, acclaim uh, that some people get, but their music is going to live long and their careers are going to be long because. One thing you can't take away, you can take away all the money, jewelry, clothes. You can't take away what you've developed in terms of talent and what you've developed in terms of your music. To all young musicians, hit as many jam sessions when you're coming up as possible. Sit in with everybody, anywhere you can. Pull out your horn, even when you're scared to death. Uh, you know, when I came, you know, when I first started, uh, somebody, one of the old cats told me, hey man, get to the jam sessions. That's where you really learn. You can sit at home all day, uh, but you really learn how to play by going to the jam sessions. And I do have a point here. Uh, you go to the jam sessions and you, you learn how to play on the spot. Uh, some of the old school cats wouldn't, wouldn't even tell you what songs they were playing. They just run it off. If you get up there, you get your chance to get up there and you play. And uh, you have to listen and understand where they're, where they're going and vibe with them. So uh, in, in my jam sessions, uh, in and around, especially when I got to Detroit, uh, when you got to Detroit, you know, you had a lot of legendary cats still here. Teddy Harris, uh, Harold McKinney, uh, you came up and learned uh, with, uh, with Racy Biggs and, and Marcus Belgrave and all these guys. And then, and then you'd get on the bandstand and, and come into a jam session and James Carter would be at the jam session. And Dwight Adams would be at the jam session. And, you know, Roy Hargrove might be at a jam session. And you call yourself a trumpet player, you got to get up and play. And, uh, and, and that's, that's what taught me how to stay within myself, how to play what I know and how to play what I know well, uh, but also how to listen and how to vibe with where everybody else is vibing because even in the jam sessions, you didn't, there wasn't a consistent band, you know, that you might hear one band playing one, one way and then they call you up and the whole band changes then because, hey, you get somebody else up on keys, you get somebody else on drums and you play a song. And so you had to understand how to listen and, and, and use, you know, use your ears to lead you to where the band was going to kind of feel the vibe. And so those jam sessions were critical uh, in being able to teach me how to go out on the road and play with musicians who had slightly different styles, you know, of playing. Uh, you weren't just stuck in the Detroit way to play. Uh, so because sometimes your budget is limited, uh, particularly in this type of music and, and smooth jazz and, and smooth souls, like what I like to call it, you end up using house bands uh, places, you know, in, in different places because they just don't have the money to bring a whole band in. So just like you said, you send your music down. Uh, to, to somebody, you hope that everyone's professional enough to learn it. You get in, you may run through the songs at, at, a, at a sound check or at a, at a, at a quick rehearsal, uh, and you play within yourself. You feel, you know, I, I tell the guys, in fact, uh, tomorrow I'm flying out to DC and I'm using another band. And uh, these guys I know are good musicians. Uh, obviously, we haven't rehearsed together a lot, so they're not going to play it quite the way I'm used to playing it. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, look, play my song the way it feels good to you, you know, where it lays in the pocket for you. Play it in the pocket and I'll, I'll mix with you. I'll play where, with where you are and then we'll present the music together and it'll all come out just fine. 
And that's attributable to me being able to play in these jam sessions and play with different people and understand how to play within myself.